Well, did we get so we got the San Juan Hill, right? Yeah. And yeah. who got all the credit for San Juan Hill? Rosie. Yeah. Teddy Roosevelt. No one called him Rosie. No, Teddy Roosevelt was a very good boxer. And if you called him Rosie, he'd flat. Tio. They called a good baseball player Babe. Hmm? Oh that, 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 thank you for the non sequitur. <laughs> and the sky is blue. All right, so yes. Um, have you ever been to the Majority Youth Club? Yeah. And when he was there, you know, that's part of Teddy Roosevelt National Park. And that's really cool. If anyone been to that in North Dakota? I mean, a few. It's really cool. To the, the Roosevelt National Park. To Medora. That's really a neat place. And you get to go to uh, uh, Weibo. Who's been to Weibo? And you left? <laughs> I have so much family in Weibo. My family is so much. That explains a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to Weibo many times. My summer job, I have to go to Weibo once every two weeks. Sorry. Delivered beer. Once every two weeks. That was the best summer job ever. Not for what a lot of you are thinking. <laughs> no, I just paid really well. It was a good job. I kind of want that. Well, the plug, it as soon as San Juan Hill, as soon as San Juan Hill, those other hills fell around Santiago, the Spanish could not remain there. Their fleet tried to make a break for it, destroyed, and that ended the war. Basically, taking those hills, Spain had no choice but to give in. Puerto Rico, an American army under Nelson A. Miles, took it, no sweat, no sweat. And the point was, yeah, the point was this this war ended very quickly, very quickly, in mean, just a couple weeks in reality. Secretary of State John Hay called it a splendid little war. Isn't it great? So much fun. Now, you don't need to get these exact numbers. I put it up there to give you an idea. So about 1,600 were casualties, they were wounded. 345 Americans died, about 10 times that number of Spanish. But 340 Americans died in battle. Look how many American soldiers died of other causes. And that's just in about a month and a half. And so what you have to get is this. More American soldiers died of, what's your thing? Well, disease. Disease? Infection. Food poisoning. Food poisoning and disease killed significantly more Americans than the Spaniards. So first off, yellow fever was a big deal. I did not put this down. I forgot to put this on the slide. It, write down Dr. Walter Reed. Dr. Walter Reed. And Reed was an army doctor, and he was responsible once the United States <laughs> took over Havana. And what spreads yellow fever? Mosquitoes. They didn't know that. Reed was the first one to confirm that. Now, how do you get rid of yellow fever? Hmm? How do you kill mosquitoes? Machine guns. You start shooting in the air. Eventually, you're going to hit something. Yeah, that's what they did. They poisoned. Well, first off, they got rid of any standing water, cisterns, anything in the city. And then the water in the swamps outside, they poisoned. They just, because mosquitoes yeah, but how? But how? They just sprayed gasoline. Oh yeah, gasoline. They killed everything. <laughs> then lit it on fire. Yes. Yeah, this really isn't the most environmentally sound way to do it, but that's what they did. Oh yeah. The big thing is though, it, they learned how to dramatically reduce. So you can do it other ways. Dramatically reduce the threat of, of yellow fever. So the, when the army built, well, there was already an army hospital in Washington, D.C., but when they rebuilt it during the New Deal, they named it after Walter Reed. It's Walter Reed Hospital. That's the big army hospital. And so when, you, for example, soldiers who were severely wounded in Iraq and Afghanistan, one of the places for rehab would be Walter Reed. So you hear that, Walter Reed, it comes after Dr. Walter Reed with this. We'll have another one. We'll come back to that later. But... So like, 
So food poisoning. Part of the problem is, and this is soldiers eating, getting for rations, and I put an older can there. This is the first time that large numbers of men, large numbers of people, are eating canned or prepared foods as their whole diet. So these are all these canned foods in these new manufacturing centers because of railroads and all those things with the second industrial revolution. Well, there were no regulations on food quality at all. So what goes in a can? Yeah, anything. On the floor, from the garbage, stuff they stored in the basement for years. They called it petrified meat. Meat that they had been storing since the recession, the depression of 1793 or 1893, in these slaughterhouses in Chicago, not refrigerated, just stuck in the basement, it was kind of these gray stuff. They pulled that out, ground it up. What do you add to it? Salt. Yeah. Lots of salt, other chemicals, and make sure it's brown. You ever notice canned stuff has gravy? Why do you think? So it's, everything's one color. It could be anything in that can. Technically, technically it was cooked before it went in, but eh. Eh. So, yeah. Did they use like lead cans and stuff? Oh, yeah. So lead cans and lead solder. That's a lead can. Yeah, there were no requirements. Yeah, they knew these things were bad. And I'll explain this more later. But this is the first time, like, oh my God, we're eating garbage and men would get horribly sick. And so the point is, is that the food poisoning might kill them. But you combine that with the other diseases there. Not just yellow fever, but wherever there's camps, there's going to be dysentery. Do you know what dysentery is? Does anybody not know what dysentery is? Everyone knows? That's horrific. Horrific diarrhea. And basically that made it worse, and you could die of this. Well, the thing is, oh, I almost forgot a story. So a Montana National Guardsman was in, in Cuba, and they got a can, it was called bully beef. Bully beef is kind of a British thing. Imagine kind of a older meat. Meat, gravy, meat. It's beef, it's beef, right? And he opened the can and had a spoon, stuck the spoon in, click. Inside the can, click. Anybody want to guess what the click was? A horseshoe nail. So not only was it not beef, it's what? They're using what? Yeah, and I don't, I like my hooves round up. Kind of like my nails round up. It's not right. So men died of food poisoning. This is going to be an issue. Because there were no real regulations on food. And this is the first time that people were eating this for the whole diet, so they're getting sick. And so this is what we're going to talk about next week. Regulation and why a group called the Progressives wanted regulation of industry. And I'll use food as my example. That would be a good day to get a hot dog for lunch. What are chicken hot dogs called? Nuggets. Yes. Nuggets. A spam is coming. Oh yeah, there's, there's already things like spam. But spam, spam as we know, it came around. Uh, gosh, 1920s. Hmm? Hey, you don't have meat. That's pretty good. All right. So, I know what you were thinking. I know what you were thinking. What recipes can we bring tomorrow? I have two recipes, spam cakes. So what you do is you cut the spam and put it on the grill. Then you dump, then you make a pancake over the top. So when you flip it, mm, spam cakes. Yeah, I know, you're just going, oh, saliva. Is that enough? No. You peel bananas, you wrap spam on them. You cover them with Belvita cheese. You put it in the oven, and you get those things. <laughs> Can you imagine how good that would taste? <laughs> By the way, you're welcome. These recipes. All right, so back, 
Back to this. So by the 4th of July, it was clear the United States in 1898 had won these battles. Now remember those, those cartoons I showed you where it had Cuba as this damsel in distress. Now look at Cuba. Hawaii, the Philippines. Look at those faces. So why, is, why, is, why do they still have Cuba? Why are they well, they are white, but you notice the face. And I'll show you the next one. That's going to change too. But the face is the same, isn't it? Why now? Why do they do this now? Why do they show them like this? Because they're they, they don't want to help them, and that's, they want to justify taking them over. They're savages. They can't cover themselves. Look at obviously they're savages. Look at their faces. They started using this horrible racial uh, caricatures to justify taking them. Social Darwinism. So they did no one like question, right? That's what they look like. Yeah, just a mo not everybody, but a <laughs> <laughs> not everybody, but a lot did. Here's another one. It's so awful that you almost laugh. I mean, it's just like, it's like, I can't help it. It's so terrible. That's McKinley, like a schoolmaster. Look at Cuba now. Yeah. The caricature they use of blacks in the United States, those sample caricatures. Remember that? Hawaii, Philippines, Puerto Rico. Look at it. And then look at this, this these, these racist overtones. You know, we are superior and civilizing. So, have you used it? That's, it's awful. And I can see somebody, I mean, I know you're not laughing. I'm like, oh, that's such a funny joke. I mean, it's like uncomfortable laugh. I mean, it is. I, I can't believe that. Remember what I told you. This is the most racist time in, America, in history, not just in America. So, we then began negotiating a Treaty of Paris. And the Paris, I put them all down there, Cuba independent. The Teller Amendment said that, but you might want to put independent in quotes. What does independent mean? Spain lost Puerto Rico and Guam, and then the U.S. paid $20 million for the Philippines. What other place did the United States pay? No, no Cuba's independent. What other place did the United States pay for the treaty? After they conquered it, they turned around and paid for it so they could say, like, oh, it's not really a conquest. What? Yeah, the War of Mexico. Anybody remember the name of that treaty with Mexico? It's another treaty knowledge. Good guess. By the way, this is Paris, Texas. It's not Paris, Texas. Oh, wait, really? <laughs> the treaty, remember the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo? Did you get <laughs> and all that matters, you'd have to say as long as, as long as you can show off to your friends. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So we can look like we're not. Don't look into the light, people. Whoa. Now it's just one big dot. We wanted to look like we weren't an imperial power, but everybody knew this was a war of conquest. What came out of this then is a ratification battle. It requires two thirds of the Senate to ratify a treaty. Two thirds. So, the ratification battle, and what's formed was a very vocal anti imperialist league. The American Anti Imperialist League really pushed these ideas. Now, I put a bunch of names up here. You don't need to write down all the names. But just to review, let's go through them real quick. Do you remember what Union Samuel Gompers was ahead of? The union that survived. You know, the Knights of Labor was crushed. What ones survived? Yeah, the American Federation of Labor, the AFL. Andrew Carnegie, the steel, he had sold the steel. He was very anti imperialist. William James Arthur, but the one you have to get is William Jennings Prime. William Jenny Bryan. This war was a war of conquest and against everything America stand for. So they were against the annexation and therefore against the treaty. The Treaty of Paris was the symbol of imperialism. And then I put down the four big reasons. And this is part of the reason why the Anti Imperialist League 
even though it made up a lot of people, was never all that strong. America should be for self-determination. Those ideals of the Declaration of Independence. Remember I talked about that with Washington's farewell address. But also racism. We don't want more inferior races here. Or for that matter, taking jobs. So it's not all altruistic. You know, we, we believe everyone should be independent. And then there's a real fear that if the United States does this empire and expands, corporations will get even stronger. Oh yeah, they would. And the other one is war. Once there's an empire, there's going to be constant war to keep that empire maintained. Now, throughout this era through today, the United States is going to claim to be for self-determination, but at the same time have an empire. That's not only contradictory, it's hypocritical. Racism is an issue. War, once you have an empire, you're at war. Now we're at constant war. Constant. Just war. Girl. You have grown up in war. In fact, come to think about it. September 11th, how old were you guys? September 11, 2001. Four? Three and four? Anyone two? Anyone five? I was 74. <laughs> so we have been at war, essentially, since you've been four. It wasn't like that when I was a kid. You know, the United States was at war when I was a kid. Spanish American war. But I don't don't do the math. You just get bogged down. Oh. But back to Brian. Brian had a lot of followers. A lot of Democrats in the Senate agreed with Brian, or at least were intimidated by Brian's popularity. But then Brian made a terrible mistake. Brian decided to drop his opposition to the treaty. So that's what you have to get down. Do get this down. Brian dropped his opposition. He's all opposed to imperialism. Imperialism is wrong. Empire is wrong. And then he said, I'll go ahead and vote for the treaty. The treaty passed. A pretty close vote, but the treaty passed. Now the thing is this. Once Brian dropped his opposition, he looked like a hypocrite. He thought he could come back in 1900 and run for president again against imperialism. But now it makes him look like an opportunist. He's for it, then he went for it. Against it, then for it, then against it. Brian's reputation never recovered. He would run for president again in 1900, but lose even worse to McKinley. He would run again in 1908 and get crushed by William Howard Taft. So this, in a lot of ways, hurt Brian in, in um, presidential. He never recovered. All right, so what came of Cuba? Cuba would eventually become a protectorate. You don't need to write down Senator Orville Platt. I just like this picture of Platt. In addition, the Platt Amendment. And the Platt Amendment, this was passed, started in the Senate, passed in the House. And these are the four things it did. So you can quick write these down. However you want to do it. I've made it very clear. But essentially, Cuba has no foreign policy. They can't make agreements. Who makes agreements for? The US. The US. The US can intervene. The US must lease a naval base. Actually, it was a 100 year lease, but we just kept it. And no, pub no excessive public debt. Public debt is government debt, bonds. I'll let you kind of put those down for a second, then I'm going to add a little bit to it. My phone is on. Um, so is that why we still have the Guantanamo Bay? To the yeah, Guantanamo Bay is a naval base. It was a navy. It, it's a naval facility to control Cuba. Isn't Cuba saying that we're not going to have anything to do with Cuba? They're hinting at it, but my guess is they'll. I'm going to go and finish a copy of the island. I'll quick tell you this. Guantanamo Bay, we have to come back to that. Because it's going to become a prison for a very important reason. Try to have pump 
topic. All right. So, in special topics a couple years ago, a girl made an atomic bomb in Yacht. Filled it with candy. This is a. It, it didn't quite look like this, but this was the shape of the fat boy or the plutonium bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. And she made a pinata. It was actually very clever. And we were going to destroy it. And I said, no, this is too cool. So we just bore a hole in it where she put the candy, got the candy out. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to save the pinata. Yeah. Yeah, and we replaced it with a, a deuteronium core surrounded with plutonium. Catch! <laughs> <laughs> All right, so back to this. The U.S., therefore, would decide Cuba's foreign policy. We would not. The United States is going to make sure Cuba only makes agreements. The big thing are economic trade agreements with the U.S., and that's it. That is why they have that. To make sure that U.S. corporations get full access to all the stuff in Cuba. In fact, make sure you get that down. Corporations. This is for American corporations. And especially the, the uh, octopus. We'll get to that in a second. What does intervention mean? In a way. And what's that? If you don't do what you want, then we say, don't do it. They say, no, we're going to do it. How do we intervene? We, do we send in the Marines. That's intervention. Intervention means invade. Take it over, put in a government that does what we want, and then we move. When I mean we, I mean the United States. Almost it always is to make sure that the corporations can get what they want. Next, Guantanamo Bay. So we always have a naval base, so it makes it very clear to them, we're right here. And then lastly, excessive public debt. They didn't want the government to issue too many bonds that they couldn't pay back. The reason why is simple. They want to make sure they can always pay back U.S. banks that loan them money. That is for banks. This is for corporations. This is for banks. This is the beginning of big stick diplomacy. Big stick diplomacy. We'll come back to that. Big stick diplomacy. And this was passed in the United States Senate. The House passed it then, and the President, this was President Roosevelt then, signed it. Who was not consulted? Cuba. Cuba had no control. The United States is going to dictate. How soon do you suppose it took for the United States to intervene in Cuban affairs? Four years later, the Marines went in. Time after time, the Marines would come in, Take out the government we didn't like and put in a government we liked. What kind of government did we like? Dictatorships. Because if there was a democracy, the people might vote to get rid of some of these agreements. So the United States supported really repressive dictatorships. I mean, really repressive. The last of these Cuban dictatorships was a was a man by the name of Batista. It was horrific. And he also allowed an organized crime, a bunch of U.S. mafia to come in and basically take over Havana. They built a bunch of casinos, controlled it. It was his dictatorial rule that Fidel Castro would lead a rebellion that eventually would take over Cuba in 1959. And the United States, when he decided, okay, well now we want, you know, Cubans that power. We granted him a communist. He wants. And he had a lot of flaws. But they... To this day, Castro is looked at as a hero because he stood up to the United States after the Platt Amendment. They haven't forgotten, and for good reason, they blame many of their problems on the United States. This is important. There's a reason why Fidel Castro was so popular. And as bad as Castro became as a dictator, he was still a hero because he stood up against the United States. And so, the Platt Amendment was huge. This cartoon, though, obviously pro-imperialism pro -imperialism one, it shows Cuba. And look how happy they are. That's prosperity after two years of, a, of American control. Look at the caricatures, though. Isn't that just horrible? 
It all is transferred. He was a lawyer. No, it's an interesting guy. See, I'm kidding. But his brother's in charge now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cassius. His brother, Raul. Really? Raul. Was, I'm not making that up. Raul Cassius. <laughs> Write down the answer. Because these cases are going to have great impacts in this very day. These are cases, there are a series of court cases that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the issue was this. Does the Constitution follow the flag? And this is supposed to be, all right, now you got your imperial power. Yes, racist. Are we going to be an imperial power? That means imperial power, control. Does the Constitution follow the flag? Meaning that areas of the United States conquers or tastes and treaties like Paris, do the people who live there have the same constitutional rights as citizens of the United States? This was a very controversial issue, and the Supreme Court ruled, no, you're right, no, the Constitution does not follow the flag. Technically, I mean, there's some, there's elements in here, but basically what it's saying is, we don't have to get the Puerto Ricans or the Filipinos or, or people from Guam or Hawaiian Islands, we don't have to give them the United States the rights of the Bill of Rights. They don't get the Fourth Amendment. They don't get the Fourth Amendment, I'm not sure it's a seizure, Fifth Amendment, they can be arrested and held for whatever, no cruel and unusual punishment of the eighth, right? So, the United States became an imperial power. Places that the United States attacks, they do not necessarily have these rights. The United States occupies. And the United States is soon going to occupy a lot of area. So, after September 11, 2001, the United States got involved in a civil war in Afghanistan. That's what happened. There was already a civil war going on. The United States picked one side against a group called the Taliban, who were, for various reasons, allied with Al-Qaeda. It's really, it's really complex. After the Taliban fled and the U.S. got the capital, now we're going to look for people who knew something about the attack. And if we're to Al Qaeda, we put out a reward. We'll give you money if you turn people in. What happened? Yeah, they just turned everyone in. You know, people who didn't like, you know, just you know, Holter. I never liked him, so I'm going to turn him in as a terrorist. Sorry. I hope someone walked in on this and I've never liked him. No, well, that's the money. You just get rid of people. They had all these people. The United States did it all of a sudden. I mean, it's just chaos. What are you doing? You're, you're jumping the gun on the torture. But they sent them to a naval base in Cuba. Guantanamo Bay was never a prison. It became a prison after Afghanistan. So most of your life. Why? Because of the insular cases. They made the argument that the people they send there don't have constitutional rights from these cases back in 1901. Actually, four cases, 1901 and 1903. That's why Guantanamo Bay. They don't have constitutional rights, so they don't get the right of habeas corpus. You don't have to tell them why they're in prison, and you don't have to have a trial. That's why they, they have no rights of privacy, so Fourth Amendment, and eventually no Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment. That's why Guantanamo Bay. It was not a prison. They did it because of the insular cases. Now, it's a weird gray area, because the Supreme Court ruled uh, 2005, 2006, no, no, the Constitution, they, it's there. You can't do this. And basically what happened is the administration, back then that was the Bush administration, said, no, nah, we're still going to do it. And then the Obama administration came in and vowed to close it. And... People complained, and it's still there. What was there? What was there? What was there? With, uh, people that they had in there? They didn't have a plan. And about 98% of them were completely innocent. 
most of them are now are completely innocent. What were the complaints that closed them down? You're going to release terrorists out and they're going to attack the U.S. Even though almost all of them are completely innocent. Yeah, a lot of them have. A lot of them in Yemen are terrorists now because they were captured, tortured in Guantanamo Bay, and now they're saying, the hell was it? How many are in there right now? 98? They, they've released a lot, but it took a long time. It's still there. It's very weird. But that's why. That's why you're the stuff, you know, the you're Guantanamo Bay or Gitmo. That's why. So back to this. Let me show you a great newspaper headline. The peace treaty was ratified. Peace treaty ratified. Peace. Peace. Why is this headline a little bit awkward? Peace treaty. Awful slaughter. The Philippines. The U.S. arrived. Soldiers arrived, and the Filipinos were furious. We thought. They, this is what they're saying. We thought we're going to be in place one colonial power with another one. And this is really problematic because the majority of the Filipinos could at least speak Spanish. Virtually none of the American soldiers could speak Spanish. And we're going to take power. This was, well, just devastating. And when they began to fight back, U.S. soldiers opened up on them. And this... It turned out to be not this many Americans killed, but and not thousands. But the headline says Filipinos killed by the thousands, 40 Americans killed. That's what we call peace. This is going to begin the Filipino War. But everybody calls it in your textbook, you'll see it. If it's in the test, you'll see it as the Filipino insurrection. <coughs> so I put the Filipino insurrection so you have it. These are men, women, and children executed by the United States in retaliation for a guerrilla attack. The United States began to use the very same tactics that the Spanish used in Cuba to control the population. And insurrection, though, is an important word because it implies that the Filipinos were rebelling. And who was the legitimate government of the Philippines? The U.S. The U.S. Well, of course, the Filipinos would agree, would disagree with that. Words mean something. If you say insurrection, it implies that the insurrection are nothing more than rebels. No, they believe they're fighting for their independence. It all matters. Everything matters in context. The point of view of the person saying it. So this would turn into a bloody, horrible type of war. The Filipinos didn't have very many weapons, but it is very, uh, very mountainous, jungle terrain. What kind of war do they use? Guerrilla war. war. And just like in Cuba, for the Spanish, what does a Filipino insurrectionist look like? Every other Filipino. And so they adopted the same tactics. The leader of the rebellion, oh, I'm going to skip that cartoon. The leader of the rebellion was Emilio Aguinaldo. He was a young lawyer. He is, in many ways, now kind of like the George Washington of the Philippines, and he would lead a, and we'll come back to this date in just a second, a Filipino uh, independence. Oh, sorry about the English language. I apologize now for the English language. The Philippines is PH, Filipino and F. I didn't do it. I tried along with Teddy Roosevelt to make the English language phonetic, when he was president, we failed. I tried. I tried it. People were just used to the spelling. It's just too much of a change. The same reason the keyboard, even though typewriters, the old typewriters aren't used anymore, people are used to that keyboard. Even though it really doesn't make sense now, there's no reason for it. Well, then they mix it up so it's a Yeah. So, and I can type a thousand words in that, so it didn't work with that. <laughs> the word is A, but. <laughs> so, he was a leader, guerrilla fighter. Now, eventually, and I didn't mean to put this here, eventually, a compromise would be made, and Cuba would, or Philippines would be promised their independence. 
Aguinaldo was captured by a rouge, and he finally agreed, we'll end the fighting. If you just, we'll, we'll let you become independent. The U.S. lost a lot of their desire for, for empire with the colonial empire with the disaster of the Philippines. This was nightmarish. The fighting was horrific. Those are Cuban guerrillas. Most of them, these are farm implements. <laughs> these are American soldiers. During the war, they eventually found khaki. What are you going for? Where are you going to bring me? What do we want? Uh, Hot dogs. <laughs> spam. You sell spam, don't you? Spam on a stick. Okay. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? Spam on a chick? <laughs> I was going to say chip. And what would you have to dip it in? Lard. That would be enough fat to last you a lifetime. <laughs> and this is outside the village of Penyang. Here, General Jacob Smith ordered every citizen in that village over the age of 10 executed in reprisals for a guerrilla attack near that village. These are the bodies piled up. American soldiers just lined up and gunned them down. This is a newspaper article showing it. These kind of atrocities happen. A guerrilla war is horrific. You don't know who the enemy is. They attack anywhere. Most of the weapons that they used were things like machetes. So they just hacked them apart. There's no prisoners taken in a guerrilla war. And if your friend's killed by guerrillas, what do you want? Just revenge. Yeah, kill them. These are the worst type of fighting. Well, then you were talking and this is a good picture showing what is the whole fear of it. I really like this picture. Well, actually, I like it for what it shows. It's scary. They're terrified. I guarantee the American soldiers are terrified. They're interrogating them, trying to find information on guerrillas. And you can see the problem already. Everyone's scared. No one trusts each other. And what language do you suppose he's speaking? And what do you what do English speakers or anybody who speaks a different language do to somebody who's not understanding it? Yeah. You yell louder. Why don't you understand English? They repeat back in Spanish, everyone's scared, and it, it, it is a disaster. And if that didn't work, the United States did use all sorts of torture. The most common was the water torture. That's in your textbook, too, that picture. On the back, head held backwards, dump water over their face. Simulates simulates drowning. Horrific torture. Yeah, some people do die. Some people do, do some people do drown or have heart attacks. In the 1970s, Israel was using this torture to find um, terrorists who were attacking them. Palestinian liberation organizations, complex Israeli history, but they didn't want to admit they're using torture. So what do they call it? That's waterboarding. Mm -hmm. Waterboarding. And it's the same, it's just water torture. And when the United States started doing it, they didn't call this enhanced interrogation. That's yeah, torture by any means. It's a horrific torture. That's the whole thing about the insular cases. The Constitution doesn't apply, you do it there. That was all to give them something they knew was illegal. That's why they did it in Guantanamo. Yeah. You know, that, that was kind of made up. Torture, but the Chinese had other tortures that were the Chinese were experts in torture. And but this is a horrific torture. The United States would execute 80 Japanese soldiers after World War II for war crimes for using this torture on American, British, Australian prisoners. Yeah. So they just pour water in the face. Or, yeah. yeah. They have the, the cloth. Well, sometimes they put a cloth, this one or not. Right. You just pour it on your face or what little bit of water runs down your nose and stuff, and it feels exactly like you're drunk. And it's one of those things, oh, we yeah, actually take it. It's absolutely terrifying. Hmm? What did the cloth do? The cloth, so not as much water goes on your throat. Oh, so, so it's just to make sure you can turn out basically. Yeah. Yeah, you only need it about 10 seconds. So, 
At first, they reported the war, but pretty soon the United States got involved in censorship. What censorship? This is a great cartoon, by the way. They didn't allow the media to cover what was really going on. General Otis was the American commander at first, and also the first governor. You don't need to know Otis. I just, that's, that's him. And this is a reporter. And here are American soldiers telling him what to write. They didn't want the American public to know how horrific this war was. And this would be pretty common. Now, I don't like you studying other things. I get it next time, and it disappears. So, the, and this is the way we get the war news. Now it's all censored. They, they really control the press. In fact, they restricted what they could, what they could televise or have pictures of, and now they do that. Because they don't want people to know how horrific war is. War, by its very nature, is anti-war. Does everyone know what I mean? War is so horrible that nobody would ever fight it if they really knew how bad it was. But we're, not, we're going to get right to, I'm going to skip a couple cartoons because so I want to finish this. Finally, when the war did end, when Albanado and the United States agreed to some kind of agreement where, they, where the Philippines would get their independence, these are how many American soldiers Over five more than died in the Spanish American War. But look how many Filipinos died. Approximately 20,000 guerrillas and at least 250,000 Filipino civilians. These kind of wars are horrific on civilians. Horrific. Those are American casualties right there. There's estimates as high as 300 to 400,000. So, to give you an idea of context, in Vietnam, there were over at least 4 million civilians killed. In Iraq, we have no idea how many have been killed since 2003. Conservative estimates by the Pentagon have been about 200,000. There's been estimates of over a million killed in Iraq. Civilians, after the United States invaded. And so these type of wars are horrifically bad on civilians. They're targets of everyone. This was a nightmare. The United States is going to decide after this, maybe colonial imperialism is not very good. Let's do a different type of imperialism. What? Economic. We'll get to that. So, the election of 1900, though, was before the Filipino insurrection got really bad. And this really was a wartime, or kind of a war, a jingoistic election. President McKinley rode the wave of the victory, just as President Bush in 2004, so I've given one in your lifetime, rode the wave of victory in 2004, you know, before Iraq evolved into horrific civil war. He rode the wave in 2004, was like, so this has happened before. Your President Lincoln, but think about Zachary Taylor in 1948. He was quite old then. 1848 after the Mexican War, General Grant, Eisenhower would ride his war fame to become president. So back to this. Here's McKinley. Now, what they could say is, 1893, when they had a Democratic president, economic panic, banks were disasters, Spanish rule in Cuba. With Republicans, factories are booming. Banks are healthy. Cuba, free. And it says the American flag has not been planted in foreign soil to acquire more territory, but for humanity's sake. Ah, this is the Republican ticket. Hobart was his vice president, Senator Hobart. He's gone. The Republicans picked a new vice president, Teddy Roosevelt. You've got to get Teddy Roosevelt back. McKinley, Hannah picked Roosevelt. Why? Because he hated Roosevelt. Roosevelt, Roosevelt was Assistant Secretary of the Navy. With the Rough Riders, he rode that fame. He literally got back and announced he would run for governor of New York, then the most populous and wealthiest industrial state in the Union. He won easily. This is what you have to get. Roosevelt 
was not conservative. Roosevelt wanted to control capitalism. He was what they call, this is the word you have to write down, progressive. He's progressive. Hannah, Hannah didn't want a progressive in New York. What do vice presidents do? Nothing. nothing. What he said is, I'll get that damn cowboy out of Albany. He'll do nothing. We're finished just tomorrow. What are we having on Friday? What kind of brainstorm list? What revolution? What country? Friend. All right, French Revolution. Yeah. Jacobins, Committee of Public Safety, the Terror. We know this. But you can think about this. You might not be able to just say them all right up, but once you start hearing it, isn't it amazing how it all comes back? French Revolution is really it. Yeah, it was like, oh, so funny. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what was the day, though, that, like, basically made it so they stopped the Great French Revolution? No, it wasn't. Yeah. The what? What was, like, the new holiday that basically oh, oh, made it gosh, so everyone uh, stopped the Great The of the Supreme Being. The, yeah. Uh, the Church of the Supreme Being. Yeah. And Robespierre came out, like, proclaiming himself this. And yeah, and then everyone was like, eh, no. Remember Napoleon had his clue on the 18th of Rumar, their calendar? <laughs> yeah. That was the most confusing thing I've ever heard. Who was the chick who murdered him? <laughs> the chick? Oh, yeah, who murdered him? Uh, Cornette. Who did she murder? Was it Robespierre? No, it was no. Rose no, it was the um, one who was writing the really pro terror newspapers and she killed him and he became a martyr at all. I can't remember their names though. Murat. Yeah, you remember he used one he had a skin disease so he used to sit in a bathtub all the time. Oh yeah. And so he murdered she murdered him in his bathtub plot with the Claudette. Cordet. It's really easy to remember like what happened and like what came out of it, but I can't remember like their names, but I can't remember like the times. Yeah, and that's that's the thing though. If you remember that if you want to learn more, the, the, the other stuff will come in derivatives. Yeah. That's that's the thing about it. You have some place to fit those names. Which is helpful. Oh. If you knew nothing about it, and then all of a sudden I told you that, it would make it would just be fine. Okay. So are you still okay with me like shadowing your class next year for an independent study? Class? That would okay, be perfectly fine. Alright, so I'm gonna go talk to Mr. Furlick about it. And one more thing. Are you guys going to take special topics? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Even if, don't worry about six periods. It changes the period. Oh, it changes? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's been, it's been six period, I think, for two years, for three years. Before that, it used to be like four period. Oh. Yeah. So don't even worry about the schedule for it. If you guys want to take I, you, special topics, it's fine. All right. When you had special topics, you know, I was so mad because it was the year that, like, the scheduling was all super, super weird because the principal did it. And, and she wanted to take, she was going to take both, wasn't she? Well, okay, she was going to take special topics, but then with sixth period, it was, like, the only period that she could take. Like, okay, she was taking Spanish 5 that year, but she had to do it during the Spanish 4 class. Oh, that's what it was, yeah. And I think that was it, so she took AP Euro instead. But she convinced Jen, I think, to take special topics, right? Jen, yeah. Yeah, she's like, oh, Jen, take special topics with me. And I was talking about, I was driving with them after finals one time, and Jen was like, yeah, you're the one who told me to take it. You didn't even take it with me. But she but you, couldn't. Huh? She couldn't take it. But she liked it, didn't you? Jen? Yeah. yeah. That was a good class. That was a fun class. This year's just, this year just top one. I got some real troublemakers in that class. Yeah, yeah like those blonde some bad people. Eggs. Those blonde people. Yeah, that's in your class. They're the hospital freaks. All of us suck. Quiz today? Tomorrow. I said tomorrow. Why did I say that? <laughs> we'll do the quiz, but then after after plan nine, we'll start talking about assassination. And we'll set it up, and then we'll start doing. Is that what we said? Our conspiracies. Conspiracies. Oh, conspiracies. And then we'll start doing conspiracies after the quiz. Okay. Hmm? Just awesome. Like all that stuff.
Okay, so that's good. I can talk to Mr. Perlick after yeah, that. Yeah, no problem. All right. And Eli picked the greatest movie ever to watch. Yeah. Was it that Plan 9? Plan 9! Or Grave Robbers from Outer Space. That's much. 